All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. In fact, the final video of 2021. Thank you for being here. In this video, we're gonna do things a little bit differently. It's not gonna be anything super fancy, just a simple conversation between me and you guys, my subscribers. What we're gonna do in this video, first of all, is taste some beers that I brewed earlier in the year, or actually even before 2021, uh, that I stashed away and uh, have let age and mature out for a little bit. So it should be fun to see what those are like now after many months in the bottle. Um, secondly, we're going to go over kind of what were my favorite brews, uh, my least favorite brews of the year, uh, what kind of notable events happened for the channel over the course of the year, and what are the plans moving forward into 2022. I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday season and is looking forward to 2022 as much as I am. The first beer we're going to crack here tonight is my Czech Pilsner. Uh, so I think I made this one about midsummer. I remember it being a really, really good beer. Actually, one of my favorites of the entire year. I did a decoction mash on it, and I fermented it in my Spike CF5 under pressure, um, and it turned out pretty nice. So we'll see how it's fared over a couple months in the bottle. Visible carbonation, not much of a hiss on top though. Still crystal clear. Oh yeah. Beautiful light gold color on it. Um, yeah, and decent head on it too. All right, got carbonation, that's good. Um, yeah, it's got a nice, it's still got a good color to it. Um, I don't know how well that's gonna show up on camera given I'm inside and my lights are set up to the front and to the side, so there's nothing behind it to show off how light it really is. Um, but we'll give it a taste. Smells very much like you get that saws, you get the uh, the kind of hay-like pilsner character. Wow! Wow! Okay, that got better. <laughs> it's got a like honey, honey straw like maltiness. A lot of that sulfur is gone. It's still there. Very muted though. It's still there. It gives a little bit of a bite. Um, you get that wonderful sauce character though. Oh my god. There's no other European hop in Pilsners that does what Saws does, <laughs> in my opinion. It's a great hop. Um, yeah, this beer kept up wonderfully and got much better, I think, as I let it lager for six months. I, who's surprised by this? No one. Basically, this video is my way of saying thank you to you guys for being subscribers and being part of this channel because you guys are the reason why this is all worth it. This channel started out 2021 on January 1st with 6,789 subscribers. And as I'm shooting this, it is now 14,402 subscribers. So we more than doubled over the course of 2021, which is insanity to me. I'm very grateful to every single one of you guys. I managed to put out 50 videos this year. I didn't quite average out to one video every single week, um, but it got pretty close, I guess. And I was able to brew 24 beers over the course of the year, um, not including one that is in the fermenter right now, but isn't gonna be ready until well into January. So this is really a personal thank you note to every single one of the 14,402 plus subscribers that I've got so far. Um, you guys are the reason why I'm doing this, and uh, I'm very grateful to each and every single one of you for enjoying my content, interacting with it, and hopefully learning from it as well. The reason why I do this is to teach people how to brew stuff, to give them new ideas, uh, to challenge some otherwise accepted conventions, and just to have a lot of fun with the whole thing. You guys have shown me that you like that, so I'm gonna continue doing it well into 2022. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for being a part of it. It means a lot to me. So the next thing I wanna talk about were, what were my top three favorite brews of the year? And what were my bottom three, or my least favorite? So the third from the top spot is occupied by the Christmas beer that I actually just made, the Weizenbach, uh, the, with spices. Uh, this was a really great success, actually. Um, I had a ton of fun making this beer, and it, it turned out better than I ever could have imagined, and it will continue to get better as it ages. Um, that's a beer that I'm very proud to be giving away. It's a beer that I'm very uh, happy to have made. 
It's a beer that has a tremendous amount of complexity and depth of flavor. From that vice beer yeast, which is virtually simulating cloves in the beer with that banana ester on top, along with all of that deep, rich maltiness that's coming from a variety of different darker German malts, to having a really nice palette of spices on it as well, with cinnamon, nutmeg, orange peel, vanilla, and ginger. Um, and it all worked together really, really well and came together to this final product that I really was very proud of. Uh, so that was awesome. This, the number two spot is actually occupied by my Irish Red Ale. It was the first beer that I brewed on my Spike CF5 when I bought that earlier in March. And that was a uh, huge success mainly because it was also the first time that I could implement temperature control with precision of plus or minus 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that made an absolutely massive difference in the quality of the beer. I was already implementing forms of temperature control before that, so I had a couple degrees variance, but it wasn't too bad. But having that like 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit precision was actually a game changer for me. Um, and that beer tasted amazing. It was actually grain to glass in less than a week. It's a beer that I would gladly make again, and I don't really recall whether or not I had any sort of in potential improvements on that one. Um, I would gladly brew it again the way it was. But the number one spot is occupied actually by, it's, I can't decide between this beer right here, the Czech Pilsner, or my Italian Pilsner. And I'm kind of edging towards the Italian Pilsner now in the moment, but both of those beers were part of my Pilsner series I did over the summer. I love that Czech Pilsner so much because of the decoction that I used in it and just everything kind of came together in a really great way. But the Italian Pilsner really blew my mind. Um, I think I'm gonna have to give it to the Italian Pilsner to be honest because it had, because those sapphire hops are something else. And when you dry hop a Pilsner, um, that's just, it gives it so much more expression. It just gets to be so ridiculously aromatic. Um, and there was such a unique floral character that came out of that Pilsner um, that was just, uh, I loved it. It was probably, yeah, it was, it was definitely my favorite beer of the year. It was one of those situations, again, where everything just worked out really, really well and played together very, very well uh, to create a beer that was absolutely delicious. Um, I've also had several people brew that beer and come back and tell me that they were equally impressed with how it turned out for them. Actually, somebody messaged me as recently as a few weeks ago saying they had brought it down to their pub and really enjoyed it uh, with a whole bunch of their friends who apparently were they're very experienced beer tasters and said it was really good too. So that's kind of more on whoever brews it, not on the recipe maker. I remember I just give you the ingredients and you know, it's up to you to make the actual beer. But it is really nice to know that people are making these beers, getting good beers out of them and enjoying the whole thing. And that's the whole point, isn't it? So now we'll talk about my three least favorite beers. I'll try to keep that one quick again uh, and talk about why. Uh, so uh, third from the bottom is the German Pils that I made in the summer uh, as the first beer of the Pilsner series. It didn't go great. Um, the brew itself was fine and the beer at the end of the process was 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 fine, you know. It wasn't really a bad beer. It just was overdone in terms of what hops I picked and when I added them. Uh, so what I did was I had a combination of Haller Tower, Mittelfruer, and Tetnang, uh, two hops that do kind of clash against each other in a way. Um, and I added a whole bunch of them at the 15 minute mark and I had a whole bunch of them at the zero minute mark. Um, and what ended up happening was I just added way too many. And the result of that was a beer that had way too much of a berry character that was out of place for a German Pilsner. Um, if I could go back and do that again, I would end up just cutting the amount of hops I used in half. Uh, I'd probably just stick with one hop, probably the Hallow Tower Mittelfur, or I would actually sub in some Saz because that hop, again, is amazing in Pilsners. I cut out the Tetanine completely because that kind of doesn't really belong in there. Um, after doing some further research, I discovered that that's not really a common hop in German Pilsners, and I didn't really need to put it in there in the first place. Uh, but hey, lessons are learned, right? But it ended up just being a very unbalanced beer that didn't taste very good. The second from the bottom spot is occupied by the Blood Orange Hefeweizen that I made in the spring to summer transition. I made that beer with the intention of showcasing some extracts um, and seeing what I could do with flavor extracts, but it turns out that I just overdid it. When I designed that beer, I was actually concerned about whether or not it would even work out um, because of the extracts, and it turns out that it didn't. I just added a little too much. It is exceptionally easy to add too much extract to a beer to flavor it. You never know how strong that extract actually is, 
and after you add a little too much, there's no going back. And it, uh, it ended up tasting harsh and out, you know, fake and somewhat alcoholic as well. Um, and I would have been much better off just simply using standard blood orange puree or the real standard fruit in the whole thing instead of just using the extract. I wanted to make that video so I could show that you could do it um, and you certainly can do it. Uh, you just have to dose the extract properly and I did not. And the number one spot in terms of my least favorite brews of the entire year was actually occupied by, I think it was the first beer of the year, the English IPA that I made. Um, that beer was way too bitter. Basically what happened was I ended up using a bad selection of bittering hop. I used Target instead of something that would have been a little bit better, like Challenger. Long story short, the oil compositions in Target and the amount that I added uh, created a very harsh and uh, very sharp bitterness uh, that ended up making the beer borderline undrinkable, actually. Um, it was a very tough pint to get down, and the only way it would have gotten better is if I had actually let it sit and age for six to eight months for that bitterness to come down to a more appreciable level. I believe the actual recipe of the beer would have been fine if it had aged out, but there was no time for that, and uh, the beer itself was not good at all. It also ended up being a very dark colored beer, and it didn't need to be. Um, there was a lot that went on in that recipe that just was not good, and um, that's one of those beers that's on my short list to remake and do better on, um, because English IPAs, when they're done right, are actually really, really good, and uh, that was not the case where it was done right. It was not done right at all. With that out of the way, I think it's time for us to move into our second beer tasting of the evening. So what I picked out actually was the Belgian Double that I made uh, in, I think it was about springtime. I wanted to see how it aged over time, so I bottled a whole bunch of it. There were definitely some things that I could have done better with it. Um, it definitely had a decent amount of room for improvement, but I do remember the beer itself being pretty good overall. So, we'll go ahead and pour ourselves a uh, glass of this Belgian Double. Alright, we get carbonation. That's good. I'm always happy to see carbonation uh, when I've had these beers sitting around for like six to eight months. Okay, so, yeah, that looks good. That looks pretty good. Um, wow, this clarified a lot. <laughs> when I hold it up to the light, it is a beautiful red color. It, it looks like an amber ale, actually, um, which is way more clear than it was when I tasted it. Um, so that's really cool. It still provided a pretty good head, uh, decent carbonation so far, too. Aromatics are good. Lots of pear. A little cidery. Oh, wow. The flavor's changed a lot, actually. Um, yeah, it's pretty cidery, actually. That's interesting. Um, it's still got some of the pear. Uh, but not as much. It's kind of more. It's kind of more traveling towards that cider uh, character. I noticed that when I had uh, a saison that I bottled, like a traditional Belgian saison, I bottled and I let that sit for over a year, um, and that turned out to be pretty cidery as it got old. Decent amount of like spiciness in this too. Um, a little bit of that peppery flavor, but it's not nearly as. Uh, as dominant as it was when it was younger. Good malt backbone. Good amount of just overall dark, bready character. Still tastes super dry. Uh, super, super drinkable. For 8.4% uh, beer. <laughs> it's still got that kind of deadly characteristic. Good candy syrup flavors, um, but not too much caramel really coming through. Um, just kind of got that dark fruit character. That's about it. It's not bad. I think it may have been a bit oxidized over this time. Um, I bottled this six, maybe eight months ago. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if it got a little oxygen in the bottle. Um, I use the ITAP for all of these, by the way. Some of the bottles have maintained carbonation and some of them haven't. Um, this one luckily has. Yeah, there's still a lot to be desired with this beer. It wasn't bad. Um, it didn't make my bottom three. 
<laughs> but it's definitely a lot to be uh, desired here. It could use a lot more yeast expression and it could use a lot more maltiness. The next segment we're gonna talk about here is uh, equipment that has been gained or lost. I am not gonna go through and justify every single piece of equipment here. So we'll start with equipment that is no longer being used. This is not necessarily equipment that I have just completely gotten rid of. A lot of the stuff I actually still own, I just don't really use it at all. Um, and I figured that that's kind of worth noting. So the first is the Firmzilla, not the Firmzilla all-rounder. I still have that, although I really don't use it anymore because um, I don't pressure ferment all that often. It is going to be a go-to for pressure fermentation. It's still a great piece of kit and I intend on using it, so I'm not getting rid of that. I'm talking about the full-size Firmzilla, the one with the collection jar underneath. Um, the reason why I got rid of that is mainly because the collection jar itself um, is a huge pain in the butt, especially if you take the valve apart and clean it after every brew, because you should be doing stuff like that. Crud builds up in there, and that can be bad for your beer. Um, it is a huge pain in the butt to try and get that thing out and disassembled, cleaned, put back together after every brew. Um, and then also, not to mention, every thread on that thing is plastic and it's so easy to cross thread. It's so easy to strip those threads. Um, and I just had so many problems replacing that collection jar. I actually ended up replacing the collection jar three times and I can't tell you how many times I actually replaced the CO2 nozzles on the bottom of it because I just kept breaking them or cross threading them, which is partially my fault, but also that's a lot of times to replace a piece of equipment. So I just got rid of that and um, I ended up upgrading to stainless steel and I didn't really look back. Um, I also got rid of a whole bunch of old equipment. I had some old brew kettles. I had some old starter kit items from like four or five years ago that I just wasn't using. Um, I got rid of the Beverage Doctor pH pan that I was using. Um, that just broke on me, uh, probably because I wasn't storing the probe properly. Um, so that one's on me as well but I actually ended up replacing it with something much nicer, so we'll talk about that later. Um, I stopped using the Spike CIP ball because I don't have a good enough pump to actually fully utilize that thing. Uh, the pump that I use is not good enough to build up enough pressure uh, to really fully take advantage of the CIP ball, so I ended up actually cleaning that thing by hand, and that's fine for me. Um, I have kept it, though, in the event that I do end up getting a better pump at some point, maybe something like a Blickman Riptide, um, that will probably work just perfectly with that thing, but uh, for the equipment that I have now, I just uh, it, it's kind of been thrown in the back and not used for a while. Uh, also, I stopped using the ITAP um, that I was sent earlier this year, mainly because it just doesn't make sense for me. I don't like the fact that it sits on my kegerator and just doesn't get used because I don't bottle that much. I got a traditional stainless steel beer gun uh, that I've been using instead. Uh, to bottle everything up uh, that I need to. And that's been much easier for me to use because A, it's easy to clean, B, it's all stainless steel, and, and C, I can just pull it out of my storage area, hook it up to a keg, bottle what I need to, take it apart, clean it out, and put it back, um, and it doesn't take up space. And that's kind of the premium for me here in an apartment. But as far as equipment that has been gained, um, I most notably, I think, got the Spike CF5, the conical steel fermenter. Um, that's been fantastic for me. I started using Pure O2 to oxygenate my wort. Uh, so using the Spike CF5's carbstone setup, um, I started doing that this year, and that's that's made a decent difference, I think, in my beer. I wouldn't say it's made a huge difference, um, but it's nice to have. I also got an Anvil bucket fermenter for those easy bucket fermentations, and uh, that's been fantastic, actually. The steel fermenter is great, um, and in a, in a bucket configuration with a ball valve at the bottom, um, that's been great for beer. I also got the Bar King line cleaner kit. Um, this was another product that was sent to me. That actually ended up being super useful. And I've gone through and cleaned my lines more than I used to, to be honest. Um, having that small, very easily stored uh, line cleaning kit has been awesome. And uh, anytime that I get a little bit of fruitiness in my beers that doesn't uh, seem like it belongs, I just hook that thing up, clean out my lines in all of 10 minutes, and it works like a champ. So that's been actually a really, really nice piece of equipment to have. Um, I also got the ITAP, uh, kind of been over that. Um, I got the Last Straw Bottle Filler as a replacement for the ITAP. Um, I mentioned I got rid of the Beverage Doctor pH pen. Um, I picked up a Apera pH pen instead. 
and that has been pretty good. One thing to point out with the Apera, the Apera comes with a complete kit. You get storage solution, you get three different pH calibration solutions, and that gives you a much more precise calibration routine, um, and it comes with more than enough solution to last you for at least a year. It's a bit more pricey, it's been worth it in my experience. It seems to have a lot more uh, reliable automatic temperature compensation as well. But to be noted is that you should always store your pH probe uh, in either a calibration solution or a uh, some kind of neutral solution. Not distilled water, not wort, not regular water, um, if you can avoid it. Uh, that's going to extend the life of the probe, as is something that I learned over the last year. So. Uh, if you're storing it dry like I was, stop doing that. The last thing I got was actually a mill, uh, so my partnership with Northern Brewer has been awesome. They sent me a Hullrecker mill, which is their standard two roller mill. I don't think having fresh ground grains has really made a huge impact on my beer, but what has been nice is keeping my unmilled malt uh, for a longer period of time, because unmilled malt is much less susceptible to uh, staling, basically, over time, uh, than milled malt is. If you order your grains pre-milled, um, that's fine. You know, you don't need a mill to make beer with at all. Uh, but it is going to cost you a bit more from the supplier, and it's also going to give you a lot less shelf life uh, on those grains. So this has given me the ability to order unmilled grains in bulk now, and I have a couple five-gallon buckets that I filled with uh, base malts, basically, uh, and I've been holding on to those uh, for several months now. So there's really no risk of those staling as long as I keep the lid sealed on those buckets. But that at least gives me several more months of storage versus just the standard milled grains. So now it's time to taste the final beer um, of the evening. And we have not only gone back in time gradually as I brewed, but also up in alcohol by volume. Um, this is the Russian Imperial Stout that I made last year. Um, the video came out in March of this year, but I brewed this actually I think in December, so probably actually about a full 12 months ago, um, in a snowstorm, and I had a great time with this one. It was a double mashed beer, uh, so what I did was I mashed in with half the grain bill, and then I actually mashed in a second time into the wort that I had just created with the first mash with the other half of the grain bill, and it resulted in a really nice beer. So it gave me a higher efficiency for a high uh, gravity beer, and uh, the end result was pretty good. The only problem was I didn't give this beer enough time to really condition uh, as I was uh, tasting it. So I gave this, um, I basically ended up criticizing this more than I needed to uh, because I thought something was wrong with it. I remember it tasting very phenolic and uh, it ended up fermenting out way, way drier than I expected and combine that with some dark cherry flavors, and I thought it was an infection, uh, but it turns out I was just too impatient to actually really sit around and wait long enough. I gave it three months in uh, bulk storage to condition, and that was not enough time. It needed at least another three months. So here we are now, a full 12 months later, uh, tasting this beer. So this is one of the few bottles that I've actually saved off for this long, and I'm kind of interested to see what this tastes like. Um, so, without further ado, the Russian Imperial Stout 2021, about to be tasted. Wow. That has gotten so much smoother. Um, this is, it's still not as good as the other one that I did like two years ago. Um, it's still got kind of a cherry note to it that does not belong. But the back half is very good. There are so many flavors of chocolate and coffee and dark roasted malts um, that are coming across in a really, really, really nice way. A smooth, gentle, just rich way. The chocolate's coming through in almost a milk chocolate way. Uh, it's pretty sweet, actually, which is really nice. Um, none of that roast is acrid anymore. There's just that sharp cherry up front, which that, I don't really know what that's coming from, um, but that's not going away. More than likely, that's a fermentation problem. Um, 
I fermented this with Kvike yeast and it was not uh, a great fermentation. Um, if I were to do this again, I probably would not use Kvike. I'd probably just use a traditional English ale yeast or something like that and just, you know, build up a huge starter. But uh, could be a, it also could be from the malts. I honestly don't remember what I used in this recipe uh, and what made it different. Um, but there is that kind of cherry cough syrup flavor up front, which is not pleasant. But the rest of it is awesome. Um, beyond that initial bitterness, it is really, really rich, deep, and complex. Um, loads of coffee, loads of chocolate, loads of woodiness um, and nuttiness, lots of like toasted nuts, um, which is not bad. So if you can get past the first bite of this, <laughs> it's not too bad. Um, so yeah. That's interesting. Um, it doesn't taste oxidized, which is nice. Uh, <laughs> this has been in the bottle for a long time. Um, but yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things I would do differently next time. And I think we've all been over that and beaten that topic to death if you've watched the video. The last bits of this that I wanna go over are what were the notable events in 2021 for this channel and uh, what do we wanna go and uh, set our sights on for 2022. The first thing is uh, 2021 saw a whole bunch more collaboration with other beer brewing YouTubers. That is something that will not change in 2022 by any means whatsoever. Um, if anything, I actually wanted to get more involved with the homebrewing community on YouTube here. There are a ton of fantastic homebrewing YouTube channels out there and there are more popping up every couple weeks, to be honest. But in particular, a big shout out to CH from Homebrew for Life for getting me to start making my own uh, t-shirts and channel merchandise to help kind of provide a, a little bit of a stream of income for the channel. That's been huge. Um, so big thank you to anybody who's bought any of my merch um, because that's actually really nice for me. I get like 25% of the sticker price on, on all of my merch um, and that's a great way to, to help support this channel and keep it going. Another big shout out to Yeast and the Beast, another channel out there. I collaborated with him on the Veterans Day special and he is just a great guy um, and we had a lot of fun making that video together. So there's going to be more collaborations in 2022 and we're going to continue engaging more with the homebrewing community here on YouTube. I also use the channel as a platform to raise awareness for uh, a couple issues that are very near and dear to my heart. Many of you know that I am part-time in the Army National Guard here in the States, but one thing I really do care a lot about personally is the uh, challenges facing the veterans, uh, not just of the United States, but of all armed forces around the globe. It's actually a relatively universal challenge. But I am happy to report that through both a marathon tough ruck that I did earlier in the year and a uh, full-on fundraiser that I did in conjunction with one of the videos that I put out earlier in the year, uh, we were able to raise multiple hundreds of dollars for veterans organizations and charities um, through the channel, and it was fantastic. So big, big thank you and shout out to those who were able to donate to either of those causes. Um, I know who you were, and it means a lot to me personally. Lastly, big shout out to Todd at Northern Brewer for hooking me up with a fantastic partnership with them. Northern Brewer has been providing me with both ingredients for my batches and some pieces of equipment for the last several months, and um, they have been super, super awesome about it. You know the drill, check out Northern Brewer for what you need, but uh, uh, they are a fantastic people and they have helped the channel out a whole lot this year, and I'm grateful to them as well. So now to close this whole thing out, I'm just going to talk about what are my plans for next year and what you should be expecting from this channel for next year. First of all, I'm going to take a break in January. Um, I have a whole lot of fun brewing and making content for this channel and producing and editing and filming and all the stuff that goes into it. Um, it's a whole lot of fun. It's a ton of work though and uh, it takes a lot of time. Not counting the actual brewing, uh, I actually invest about 18 to 24 hours of work into each video that I put out um, in terms of editing, in terms of filming, in terms of just designing the content and uh, doing the background work that needs to be done. Um, and it's great, but it does take a lot of time. And this is the holiday season. I'm filming this actually before Christmas because I intend on spending the holidays with my family and with those that I love. Um, and that's what is most important to me. And as a result, there will be a break in content roughly around the January timeframe. 
Um, I have beers in the fermenter. Um, I have plenty of great stuff lined up for 2022, but it's just not going to come right away. So if you don't see videos popping up in January, don't be alarmed. I'm not gone. I haven't quit YouTube by any means. Um, I'm just taking some time for myself and my family. And um, that's really what's most important in life. <laughs> that being said, 2022 holds some very exciting things for the channel. First of all, there are going to be some new uh, pieces of equipment that are going to be coming my way uh, that I am very excited to talk about, but can't quite yet. But more importantly, there are also plenty of exciting new brews coming up. Um, I've decided what I'm going to do for my next series on the channel. I, I know a ton of people enjoyed the Pilsner series, and um, I put out a whole bunch of questions as to what people wanted for the next series. I had a whole bunch of great suggestions, and I wrote all of them down. But sitting right under my nose was the natural next selection for a series. I have a whole bunch of dried Norwegian quike that was sent to me. Uh, by a channel viewer several months ago. Um, I have not brewed with any of it yet, but we have four strains of dried quike to work with, and I'm gonna add a couple extra strains on there to make a new series on quike. It's a fantastic yeast that I have some experience with. Um, I haven't quite figured everything out about it yet, uh, but I want to work more with it, and I think it's gonna be pretty cool to use this yeast that a viewer sent me from, actually from Denmark, um, but it's all Norwegian strains, and there are a whole bunch that I haven't actually even heard of. So uh, this should be fun. We're gonna do like a smash beer series with the Kvike yeasts and uh, see what happens. That'll come sometime in 2022, probably spring time frame, I think, um, just to kind of suit the types of beers that I'm planning on making with those yeasts. The last major announcement of 2022 is that I'm getting married and I'm moving. Many of you know that I got engaged earlier this year and um, the wedding will be happening in the middle of 2022 and I'll be moving in uh, to a condo that uh, my fiance actually owns. So um, I will effectively no longer be the apartment brewer. I will be the condo brewer. I don't know. It's about the same square footage actually, but um, <laughs> I, I'm not going to rebrand. I'm not going to change anything about the channel or what it's core is. Um, so you'll still see me brewing with the same equipment. You'll still see me doing the same stuff. Um, it'll just be a different background. So it's just something to be ready for. Uh, roughly around the mid-summer time frame is when you're going to start to see those changes take effect. Um, I'm really excited and it's going to be a lot of... Uh, be a lot of transition there'll probably be a break in content around the wedding because i got a lot of stuff to do but otherwise i'm very excited for 2022 it's got a lot of potential there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen uh i'm very very excited to see where this channel goes and again one big massive thank you to all of the current subscribers uh you guys are really really making a huge difference for me and uh, i appreciate every single one of you so if you haven't subscribed please do so i'm not going to end this video with a typical spiel about buying merch or going to the amazon store or any of that crap um, i just want to say thank you to everybody and a happy new year to every single one of you cheers to you and here's to the best for 2022.